Hello, um, my name is Mary Wiaki. I am an archaeologist for the state of New Mexico. And what I am going to present today is actually how to manufacture a turkey feather blanket. Um, when you're talking about turkeys in the southwest, they weren't indigenous to North America. They're coming all the way from Mexico and they're being brought up by the Aztec and traded here around 11 and 1200s. Prior to that, uh, rabbit fur was uh, the preferred uh, material. So the turkey comes in and the Pueblo are taught uh, basically how to take care of the turkey and it becomes their main herd animal. And these birds were not eaten. The bird was quite sacred to the Aztec and uh, they didn't even eat their birds. When the birds are living in South America, they have a completely different color than they do here in the Southwest. They're almost more golden and you can see some of that golden color still left in these birds here in the Americas. And iridescent colors are so magnificent, beautiful bird and I can see why some of the presidents wanted to use them as our American icon rather than the eagle. One bird yields about 600 feathers. So you're looking at a cloak that is three foot by four foot, that cloak alone uses over 15 to 16,000 plumes. So here I have um, the tail feather or the fan of the, of the turkey that's used for other things. A lot of it is for dance regalia, goes on the back of a, a headdress of a buffalo dancer. And then we have, of course, the whole wing. And you're looking at uh, Plains Indians using it for fans. You're using it also for weaponry. Um, you've got the smaller, lesser feathers, which were decorative and have that iridescent look on them. And they're being used for, again, regalia and um, on prayer sticks and other things. But the prize of what you want from um, the turkey is, of course, these wonderful plumes. You know, the turkey is the only bird that allows feathers to be taken and it won't bleed. It has a defensive mechanism to where if a predator grabs the feather, the skin will literally open up and release this feather at will and then automatically another um, plume will come out or another fletching will come out of that bird. It's the only bird that does that. Other bird species, of course, if plucked like parrots, or uh, any other bird will um, bleed to death. They're known to commit suicide by plucking their feathers. So you can literally harvest these feathers off of these birds. They molt twice a year. The reason why you want to work feathers wet in the first place is this quill is very stiff and not very flexible. So if you look at this wet feather, you can see how nice and easy that quill, it's going to become easy for me to wind this around that cordage. Aside from gathering uh, the turkey plumes that you need for your blanket, one of the other processes, of course, is the yucca cordage itself. This is the northern narrow leaf. It is one of the only plants that can be harvested year round. And as you can see, this has been harvested. Uh, I saved the root because we use this for shampoo, we use it for soap, we use it for other things, um, religious and uh, you know everyday uses. So what I need to do is literally take each single leaf off of this stalk of yucca. I want to remove the flat base because I don't need that part unless I'm making a basket. And I'm going to disarm it. I call taking the tips off of it, disarming it. And I take these and I boil them. And once I have them boiled, they become uh, very pliable. And inside of each one of these uh, leaves is that beautiful cordage. So what I have here is a PVC cylinder that's smooth and round. And a tray that holds water. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a deer antler that's already an, um, a tool that I need that's round and smooth 
and it's not going to tear my cordage. And what I'm doing is I'm re removing this silicone like outer skin from the yucca. And I'm exposing the cordage inside of here. And I'm going to flip this over and I don't need any of the silicate. So if I can just peel it, that's even better. So this is what I want to remove because this rib on the outside is going to inhibit my spinning when I go to uh, work on my cordage. Again, what I'm trying to capture is the, the fiber inside of here so that I can create the cordage that I need to spin to create the fibers. I'm pushing out all of the pulp that's inside here. So when you put it back in water, you can actually see these wonderful threads. And this, this is what I'm after. So once I have all my leaves boiled and clean, it pretty much looks like this. So this is actually one plant and look how much fiber this yielded. You see all the tools that we're using here. Again, the prehistoric woman sewing kit comes in uh, handy. We've got awls for putting holes in things. We've got a case for holding all these wonderful needles that I probably will use to sew fibers with. I've got a thimble that can be removed and placed back in. Uh, and it acts as a lock that I can push the needles through with. And my tool of choice when I'm working with this particular yucca is this awl. And in a lot of prehistoric assemblages, you'll get these awls that have a flat square end on it. But what this is, is what I call my third hand. Because when I'm going to apply my feathers, this becomes a very important tool. Because I want to open the cordage I'm going to insert my bone tool and I can pull it out. And this doesn't hurt my teeth. So if I were to use a round tool like this, my teeth would probably eventually round, in, but this is nice and flat. So this becomes my third hand. I've taken the plant, I boiled it, I cleaned it, and I've got this nice wet amount of cordage here and you want to take a good portion of your cordage and you're going to do what's called drafting. So when you look at a leaf it has a wide base and a narrow base. You always want to pull from the wide base away. When I clean and I separate I can tell that all this edge here are all the wide ends and up here are the narrow bases. Wide end here and then the narrow end. So in the plant itself, here's that wide base and here's that narrow end. And look how much just the boiling of this, how plump the fibers get once you soak them. This leaf will grow twice its size. I'm drafting, so I want to take my cordage, so I've got the wide end and the narrow end, and I'm just going to pull it so you can see how it's just nice and pulling apart. And what I'm doing is I'm getting the right width to work with before I start spinning it on my thigh. And you're just going to take your leg and the palm of my hand, and I'm going to pinch this end, and I'm going to roll both of these at the same time. And when I feel it's tight enough, I'm going to let it go. And you can see it start to do a two-ply spin on it. So this is called an S-spin. And you can see because I drafted it, so even I'm going to get the same width out of this um, leaf every time. This is exactly 30 feet of cordage. I need about 300 feet. I'm going to take a whole handful of yucca and I draft it because I need to work at least 30 feet a day and I'm trying to keep everybody as even as possible. 
and I want two rows. And you, you're going to look at this and you're saying, well, that, that's a little bit thinner than this one. Well, that's not a worry because you can come here, draft till I feel like, okay, now I've got about the same and I can add this into it. The yucca will grab itself. So I'm going to take the cordage that I've already completed and I'm going to add these pieces here to this length. Again, when you're adding cordage, you want to come back. So I've locked it. And so I'm going to take this one and I'm going to also lock that. And I'm going to start spinning the cordage. When it's a longer piece, you want to just take your time. Even if it's like inch at a time. It's already grown about three feet sitting here just with the length that I've added to it. So now we're going to come back to our feathers. As you look over here on the table, I've separated these um, feathers into different uh, categories. The first little pile here being like the primary feathers that I would want to create my feather blanket because of the length of the feather, first of all. The second batch would be, okay, I've used these all up, so this is my second choice of feather. This smaller feather, even though lesser, can be used. This will work, but it just takes a little bit longer because they're so short. So what I did is I created this small sample, and what I want to show is the very first feather that goes in here, you don't want the fletch to protrude out of this area. So again, here's the third hand. I'm going to take this and I'm going to open the cordage. And I'm going to hold the cordage here and my feather in my hand. And while the hole is still open, stick that plume in between the cordage. I'm going to bend this quill and I'm going to turn this feather. I'm going to start winding it around. And what I'm doing is I have completely hidden that quill so it won't poke me when I have the cloak on. And so if you look at this fletch or this feather, I wind it only up to where the fluffs end. So what is exposed is this part here, but it's so wet it's hard to make out. What you want to do is hide this. So again, you want to open the yucca cordage. You're going to stick your awl in here. And this is the second feather. So the first feather went in this direction. So it went in this way. This next fluff is going to go in this way. And it will continue that way throughout the manufacturing of this blanket. You're going to turn this and you're going to wind this so that it now is covering that fletch end, that part that we don't want on our skin. We want the nice downy feathers. And look how hard I'm pulling this. These feathers are really, really resilient. When you first start, it's kind of scary. I don't want to tear the feather. I don't want to just keep continuing with your awl and your third hand and just keep winding. This will also give you a respectful look at how tedious things were for your ancestors. Small finger muscles that you didn't know you had, you'll find out about. When you need to rest or you need to take a time out or you need to do other things, a simple clothespin on the edge here, that'll hold it all together until you're ready. And don't worry about, it doesn't look fluffy, how come it's not robust like it should be. It will dry out and it will start to fluff up. The more this gets handled, the fluffier it's going to get because you can see the difference between one you just started and one you've been working. And we'll continue this until we complete the whole turkey feather blanket assemblage. Cordage first 
and then once all the cordage is complete then you start your feathers so now I have the all in place I have my feather I'm gonna pull it we're gonna bend that quill and we're gonna hide and you can see what I'm hiding I'm hiding this quill here and it's gonna be underneath and cordage is spun so well that you know you have to open it because it will lock on whatever's in there so we're hiding that quill and the rest of these fletch ends so they're not poking us this is the tedious part of this blanket is putting on every single feather but in the end product is so cool see how we've hidden everything see there's that that quill peeking out right there and I'm going to cover that and you can start to see the other fletch start to disappear this loom is three feet by three feet and the blanket itself is going to be two feet by three feet. This is the warp and this is the weft. So the warp is covered by 17,000 turkey feathers and there's a hundred feet of, of yucca cordage that was used for the warp. The weft cordage is going to come down every two inches. The weft cordage, this is 120 or 130 feet of weft cordage and as you can see it's a lot smaller or, or thinner than um, the warp cordage which was um, a quarter of an inch thick and I have two sticks that I'm going to use to go in and out of the warp so I'm going to take my first um, rod and these are made of uh, Apache plume and I'm going to run this through here and I'll take my first rod and I'm going to go in out in out so this first one I want to go underneath and over the second one on top make sure I catch the one underneath and then over and under and over and under and over and under and this one is going to do the opposite so under one, under, over, under, over. So now I just start the process again. So I'm going to go two inches here. I'm going to take this outside warp and I'm going to take my cordage and I'm going to go around one more. And that's about two inches up from where I left off. So I'll go ahead and pull this to where I feel it's it's tight and then I'm going to come back again under over under over I'm going to take this out and I'm going to go with my passing stick on over under over, under, over, under, over. And I'm feeling my way through this sea of fluff because it really is quite amazing. Meandering through these warps. So I'm going to go through all the way to the end and then go two inches from that side up. So I'm going to pull that batten out. I'm going to push and I'm pushing pretty hard I'm not I'm not babying it tightening it just a little bit it feels good it's not causing the sides to go in and out it's staying pretty level or even here so I'm going to go up again two inches I've made my contact point here so I'm going to take this around again and go two inches around this 
outside warp. So I'm going to take this baton and I'm going to put it back in here. So I'm going to pull this out and I'm going to start to weave again. Under, over, under, over, under, over. All this beautiful down. It's, it's really neat to feel it in my hands. So you can see it tighten right here. So I'm going to take my baton out. I'm going to push down here, feel where my cord is here, and I'm going to take this and run it through the top of the stick again. And then I'm going to turn it to its side. And again, it's going to allow me to travel through the blanket with the weft cord. So I'm going to remove my stick and I will start the weave over again. I feel like I'm in Louis' class. Tighten it, maybe it'll hide it.